Hi, hello, and welcome to the Word. My mantra in these studies for a while now has been, salvation is in Jesus alone, not denominations. While I say this all the time, for some, it is kind of annoying, because they have pat themselves on the backs in comfort to say, my church is the true church, and without you being a member of my church, you can't be saved. Regardless of how they skirt around the subject by saying, Jesus saves, they end up saying, it is through my church, my remnant church. Is this really what the Bible teaches? Has God given a particular set of people a body of information from the word that sets them apart from all others and they become the door and the gateway to heaven? After analyzing this, are you still prepared to hold to that view? Ready to study? Let's get started. We have looked at the letters that Paul sent to the early churches in his ministry, warning them and encouraging them in Jesus Christ. The Galatians he scolded and then gave them theology to bring them back to what they were taught. Salvation in Jesus alone. The Thessalonians had no scolding, but just encouragement because they were living up to the standards of the Lord. We have another set of believers that he's writing to. They live in Corinth. What is he going to say to them? Obviously, Letters came to Paul for counsels as to how to deal with certain matters as well as feedback, like from Timothy. My gentle reminder to you is that when Paul was writing these responses, he was not thinking that he was writing the scripture. The scripture to Paul was all of the Old Testament. These are just letters to encourage the brethren. Besides, they were not even written. But since they are compiled in the book called the Bible, they are now considered part of the inspired word. I will leave it at that. But before we go any further, let us pray. The Heavenly Father, Yahweh, we are so happy to approach a God who is loving and caring and all-powerful. We praise your matchless and holy name. We reach out to you as subjects who are puny and in need of a savior. We ask for your blessings as we study to find knowledge for our already belief in Jesus Christ. Strengthen our hearts as we read the letter Paul wrote to the Corinthians, and may your words through him find lodging in our hearts, that we also will be strengthened. Bless us now, we pray, for we ask it in no other name but the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If we are studying the letter, it must make sense to have an idea of the area mentioned at the time. So let us look at Corinth historically, then its location on the map. And so when we read about Paul's missions in Acts, we can have a more and a much clearer picture. So we go into the Bible Hub Encyclopedia. It says Corinth or Corinthos means ornament a celebrated city of the Peloponnesus capital of Corinthia, which lay north of Argolis and with the Isthmus joined the peninsula to the mainland. Corinth had three good harbors, Lechium on the Corinthia and Quenquia and Shonus on the Saronic Gulf, and thus commanded the traffic of both the eastern and the western seas. The larger ships could not be hauled across the Isthmus. Smaller vessels were taken over by means of a ship tramway with wooden rails. The Phoenicians who settled here very early left many traces of their civilization in the industrial arts, such as dyeing and weaving as well as in their religion and mythology. The Corinthian cult of Aphrodite, of Malikertis, of Malikart, and of Athen, Phoenicia, are of Phoenician origin. Poseidon too and other sea deities were held in high esteem in the commercial city. Various arts were cultivated and the Corinthians, even in the earliest times, were famous for their cleverness, inventiveness, and artistic sense. 
and they prided themselves on surpassing the other Greeks in embellishment of the city and in the adornment of their temples. There were many celebrated painters in Corinth and the city became famous for the Corinthian order of architecture, an order which, by the way, though held in high esteem by the Romans, was very little used by the Greeks themselves. The church in Corinth consisted principally of non-Jews. Paul had no intentions at first of making the city a base of operations, for he wished to return to Thessalonica. His plans were changed by a revelation. The Lord commanded him to speak boldly, and he did so, remaining in the city 18 months, finding strong opposition in the synagogue. He left the Jews and went to the Gentiles. So here we see its location on the map. We see how far away from Judah or Jerusalem that Corinth is. So we see the extent of Paul's travel. Remember, there are Jews in all these cities for many years, but through Paul, we are focused on believers in Christ. Let us now go to Acts. Acts 18. Then Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he became acquainted with a Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently arrived from Italy with his wife Priscilla. They had left Italy when Claudius Caesar deported all Jews from Rome. Paul lived and worked with them, for they were tent makers just as he was. Each Sabbath found Paul at the synagogue trying to convince the Jews and the Greeks alike. And after Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul spent all his time preaching the word. He testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed and insulted him, Paul shook the dust from his clothes and said, Your blood is upon your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go preach to the Gentiles. Then he left and went to the home of Titius Justus, a Gentile who worshipped God and lived next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the leader, of the synagogue and everyone in his household believed in the Lord. Many others in Corinth also heard Paul, became believers and were baptized. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision and told him, don't be afraid, speak out, don't be silent, for I am with you and no one will attack and harm you, for many people in this city belong to me. So Paul stayed there for the next year and a half teaching the word of God. Paul stayed in Corinth for some time after that, then said goodbye to the brothers and sisters and went to nearby Chenkria. There he shaved his head according to Jewish custom, marking the end of a vow. Then he set sail for Syria, taking Priscilla and Aquila with him. So we see Paul's encounter in Corinth. Obviously, his letter is coming some time after he has visited Corinth and the concerns they shared. He would have had to respond to them. So we read in 1 Corinthians 1, This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus, and from our brother Sustens. So this letter is not from Paul alone. It's not from Paul, Silas, and Timothy this time, but from Paul and Sustens. I am writing to God's church in Corinth, or based on the Greek, the assembly of God in Corinth. To you who have been called by God to be his own holy people, he made you holy by means of Christ Jesus, just as he did for all people everywhere, who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Did you hear that introduction? just as he did for all people everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Paul begins by letting them know that there is no distinction with anyone anywhere who calls upon the name of Jesus, who believes that he is the Messiah. No distinction. I always thank my God for you and for the gracious gifts he has given you. Now that you belong to Christ Jesus. Through him, God has enriched your church, which is your assembly, in every way, with all of your 
eloquent words and all of your knowledge. This confirms that what I told you about Christ is true. Now you have every spiritual gift you need as you eagerly wait for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be free from all blame on the day when our Lord Jesus Christ returns. God will do this for he is faithful to do what he says and he has invited you into partnership with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. He mentions the second coming like he did with the Thessalonians, but he did not elaborate any further. If they remain faithful, they will see Jesus. No condemnation to note. Verse 10, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the, the church or the assembly. Rather, be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. For some members of Chloe's household have told me about your quarrels, my dear brothers and sisters. See, he received information. Some of you are saying, I am a follower of Paul. Others are saying, oh, I follow Apollos, or I follow Peter, or I follow only Christ. Has Christ been divided into factions? Was I, Paul, crucified for you? Were any of you baptized in the name of Paul? Of course not. I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius. For now, no one can say they were baptized in my name. Oh yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus, but I don't remember baptizing anyone else. For Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the good news. And not with clever speech, for fear that the cross of Christ would lose its power. So when Paul responds to what he heard, he broadened the answer by saying, are there any divisions in Christ? Is Christ divided? The answer is clearly no. So what do you think denominations are? Divisions, all claiming Christ. And everyone is pulling at something here and something there. So Paul is trying to get them to understand that Christ means unity and peace and love. If he were to be resurrected now, he may be surprised to see the amount of denominations that are pulling apart all claiming to be the true church of God. And that unless one comes through these beliefs and walls, that they cannot be saved. When you claim to be the remnant and anyone who is outside of that are lost and in darkness, then you are claiming that salvation is through your doors. We cannot box God, nor his means of giving salvation. He made it available through Jesus, and nothing changes that. The message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction, but who are being saved know it is the very power of God. As the scriptures say, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and discard the intelligence of the intelligent. So where does this leave the philosophers, the scholars, and the world's brilliant debaters? God has made the wisdom of this world look foolish. Since God in his wisdom saw to it that the world would never know him through human wisdom, he has used our foolish preaching to save those who believe. It is foolish to the Jews who ask for signs from heaven and it is foolish to the Greeks who seek human wisdom. So when we preach that Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended. And the Gentiles say, it's all nonsense. So he moves to the point of salvation in Jesus via the preaching of the gospel. Again, people will not gravitate to it because it is too simple and sounds foolish. But for those who understand it, it is excitement. So for anyone to appreciate the gospel and the salvation, he must hear it or read it, then have it explained to him. Then with the presence of the Holy Spirit in his life, he begins to appreciate and understand. So how does that person who hears it know that it's the Spirit who is giving the understanding? It's because of this simple fact that the Holy Spirit accompanies the word of God, hallelujah. So anytime it's spoken, he is present to enlighten the mind and bring conviction. Makes sense, doesn't it? Now, the simple question is 
who can have control over that? A denomination? So it's only when your church preaches the, the gospel that the Spirit of God convicts the listener? Absolute nonsense. Verse 24, But to those called by God to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. This foolish plan of God is wiser than the wisest of human plans. And God's weakness is stronger than the greatest of human strength. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. God has united you with Christ Jesus. For our benefit, God made him to be wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. He made us pure and holy, and he freed us from sin. Therefore, as the scriptures say, if you want to boast, boast only about the Lord. So this puts everyone in his or her place. We are nothing save the cross. None of us can claim anything where salvation is concerned. So who gave us the right to think that we can dictate how people are saved with our denominations holding the, this power and that power and our denomination holding this position with God? Some say that the church is the apple of God's eye. What do you mean when you say that? Is it your denomination, your congregation, or all those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? 1 Corinthians 2. When I first came to you, dear brothers and sisters, I didn't use lofty words and impressive wisdom to tell you God's secret plan. For I decided that while I was with you, I would forget everything except Jesus Christ, the one who was crucified. I came to you in weakness, timid and trembling, and my message and my preaching were very plain. Rather than using clever and persuasive speeches, I relied only on the power of the Holy Spirit. I did this so you would trust not in human wisdom, but in the power of God. That's why I read the scripture and not just preach. Yet when I am among mature believers, I do speak with words of wisdom but not that kind of wisdom that belongs to this world or to the rulers of this world who are soon forgotten. No, the wisdom we speak of is the mystery of God, which is his plan that was previously hidden, even though he made it for our ultimate glory before the world began. But the rulers of this world have not understood it. If they had, they would not have crucified our glorious Lord. That is what the scripture means when they say no eye has seen no ear has heard and no mind has imagined what god has prepared for those who love him but look at this but it was to us that god revealed these things by his spirit for his spirit searches out everything and shows us god's deep secrets hmm. so paul is making a distinction with talking to babes in the world and more mature Christians. It is clear that a new believer will not understand everything because they are fresh. Like students at any school, secondary, tertiary, primary, you learn as you go along. With maturity comes higher language, but the world's wisdom is not to be compared with God. The lowest things of God are greater than the highest of earth. That is so important to understand. That is why ordinary believers do not have to feel less of a person in the discussion with scientists and evolutionists who talk about their years of study and what they think. We accept that God is creator and the world fell because of sin and Jesus was sent to save mankind. Nothing else matters. So enjoy your education, but never ever think that what you learn in universities can make you wiser than God. You would only have to be a fool to think so. He also made a point about the spirit of God and the spirit of a man. 
I am wondering whether I should comment on it. How do we explain the Holy Spirit as a separate entity if it's the Spirit of God? And how do we explain that man does not have a spirit when Paul says it clearly here? I guess I will have to leave this alone and save myself from any discussion, convictions that I'm not prepared for. I hope I can get away. So let's continue. No one can know a person's thoughts except that person's own spirit. And no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. Uh-oh. I cannot get away. I, I got to deal with it. Now I have taught based on my knowledge that from creation and at birth, God gives his breath and we become living beings. There are those who teach that at birth, a soul is injected into the man and when he dies, the soul leaves his body and it either goes to hell or goes to heaven. I am yet to see this concept in scripture, so I cannot espouse that. But how do I explain what Paul just said? He said that a man has a spirit within him and God has a spirit. We have to go to the original text to see how it is rendered. So it reads, Who foreknows among men the things of the man, if not the spirit of the man that is within him, so also the things of God no one knows, if not the spirit of God. We still need to pry a little further. Let us click on the word for spirit, which is pneuma, which means wind, spirit, and further usage, breath. So we can only use one of the three in the passage. Since the same word is used for the spirit of God, we don't have to click on it again. So let us read what it says, no man knows the things of a man but his breath or his wind. In the same way, no man knows the things of God but his holy breath or his holy wind. If you agree by way of common sense that none of these could fit the passage, we are now left with the only next word, spirit. And what is a spirit? Let's start with the Holy Spirit. He is an invisible being. Now, you know I can't say an invisible force or an invisible wind. So it remains as being. So the Spirit of God can actually tell us the things of God because he knows them. But he did not say that the Spirit of man moves about and tells people what is in the mind of another man. He says only the man's spirit knows it. He did not say that at death the Spirit of man goes to speak to people, etc. So I can see a confusion with soul and spirit. But his focus was not on man's spirit but on God's Holy Spirit. So he continues by saying, verse 12, And we have received God's spirit, not the world's spirit, so we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us. So you see how you have to be careful with Paul. What is the world's spirit? Obviously, demonic spirit or the spirit of the devil, which is an invisible but evil being. Verse 13, when we tell you these things, we do not use words that come from human wisdom, Instead, we speak words given to us by the Spirit, using the Spirit's words to explain spiritual truths. But people who aren't spiritual can't receive these truths from God's Spirit. It all sounds foolish to them, and they can't understand it. For only those who are spiritual can understand what the Spirit means. Those who are spiritual can evaluate all things, but they themselves cannot be evaluated by others. Wow. For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to teach him? But we understand these things, for we have the mind of Christ. Drop the mic. Paul is saying, when we speak based on the Spirit speaking, we can evaluate all things and all others but they cannot evaluate and judge our words because these words are from God and you cannot lecture God. You can only receive instructions from him. You cannot tell him what he should and should not have done. We have the mind of Christ. What huge responsibility is placed on those who are in Christ Jesus who speak on behalf of God. Make sure that the Spirit is speaking through you and say only what he says. When it comes to the theology of God, we do not have to invent anything. He has already spoken. 
and he has already spoken through his prophets and holy men. We now come to 1 Corinthians 3. Dear brothers and sisters, when I was with you, I couldn't talk to you as I would to spiritual people. I had to talk as though you belonged to this world or as though you were infants in Christ. I had to feed you with milk, not with solid food, because you weren't ready for anything stronger. And you still aren't ready, for you are still controlled by your sinful nature. You are jealous of one another and quarrel with each other. Doesn't that prove you are controlled by your sinful nature? Aren't you living like people of the world? When one of you says, I am a follower of Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos, aren't you acting just like people of the world? Paul comes back again with the same argument about Apollo and Paul. But he's making a valid point. When people are fresh in the faith, their old sinful nature is going to whip them up until they learn to have more control of their thoughts and their actions. Paul is very practical. So you speak to people based on where they are in their faith. After all, verse 5, who is Apollos? Who is Paul? We are only God's servants through whom you believe the good news. Each of us did the work the Lord gave us. I planted the seed in your hearts, and Apollos watered it. But it was God who made it grow. It is not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What's important is that God makes the seed grow. The one who plants and the one who waters work together with the same purpose, and both will be rewarded for their own hard work. For we are both God's workers, and you are God's field. You are God's building. Wow. Nice point. Nice point again. It does not matter who gave you the word. When you learned about Jesus, it's not the person who told you that matters, but the Lord Jesus Christ. So if such is the case, why do church people insist that you must be baptized if you are leaving from one denomination to the other? It's still about Jesus Christ. It seems like we are like babes, still not understanding that there is no division and faction and denomination with Jesus. We are all one body of believers. And the sooner we get to understand that, the better it will be. Keep holding on to your belief that it's your remnant church and your set-aside denomination who will usher in the second coming of Jesus. You will be surprised when he comes. There will be surprises in heaven. That might be one surprise to you. Verse 10, because of God's grace to me, I have laid the foundation like an expert builder. Now others are building on it. But whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have. Jesus Christ. Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw. But on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burnt up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. Hmm. So at the end, God is the only one who will be able to judge the work you have done. Just make sure you are working with the same mind, and that is to build up the kingdom of God, not your own thinking, your own denominations. Now I see it clearer and clearer how people don't realize it's their church that they defend and not God. It's their perfect setup that they defend, their system that everyone must obey and adhere to and not Jesus. Jesus is mentioned in all that they preach, but he is still not the center of what they preach. It's a strange phenomenon, but it's the truth. Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the spirit of God lives in you? God will destroy anyone who destroys this temple. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Here goes Paul again talking about we being God's temple. How did he put it? All of you are God's temple together. We are all God's building and he dwells in us, not in the name of your church. He does not pick 
to dwell in someone because they belong to a particular denomination or a congregation. He resides in all those who call him Lord and want to serve him. We must now see that collectively and see our leader Jesus Christ and all of us as subjects, but he, too many are too blind to see. Verse 18, stop deceiving yourselves. If you think you are wise by these world's standards, you need to become a fool to be truly wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. As the scriptures say, he traps the wise in the snare of their own cleverness. Hmm. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise. He knows they are worthless. One smart dead, a two smart door. So don't boast about following a particular human leader, for everything belongs to you, whether Paul or Paulus or Peter or the world or life and death or the present and the future. Everything belongs to you and you belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God. Hmm. Do you understand that, my dear brethren? You don't follow Pastor Joseph or this leader or that leader. Everything is yours. So you are not going to receive the kingdom or anything that God has for you through anyone. All of us belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God. And what he has, we have. What is promised to him is promised to us. <laughs> Boy, that smells good. That brings more freedom to the believer. Th that helps us see that, that leaders are just teachers to teach us what the word or the Lord says. But when it's over, we are all on the same level in need of salvation. Stop letting pastors and priests and bishops and whoever else they are make you feel that they are next to the throne of God. And you need them to reach out to God. No, you don't need anybody to speak to the Lord. Stop asking people to pray for you as though their prayer is better than yours. Ask them to pray for you if you want more prayers offered on your behalf. But remember, the Lord knows what you need and he will grant your needs according to his riches and glory. I enjoy this. I really do. So in conclusion, let us take the admonition given the Corinthians by Paul and Sostens that we should depend only on God and his son, Jesus Christ, and never divide ourselves according to this and that belief. Let us pray for those who are espousing beliefs that are not scriptural or that are twisted. Let us not stay away from them as enemies, but only so that they will feel ashamed. But let us pray that they will come into a better understanding. Pray that we will start unearthing the word or they will start unearthing the word and not the words of someone else who explains the word. Each of us should be able to come to that word for ourselves with the help of others and the Holy Spirit. Search for it for yourselves. We must not go to the volumes of others to explain the word. Step by step, we must unravel its truths. And its truths are simple. This same Jesus was the Messiah who was prophesied about. He died to save us from our sins. And if we accept him as Lord and Savior, he is coming back to take us from this state we are in to eternal life. May we boast in nothing else but the cross of Jesus Christ. No matter what we do in this life, may we have one focus to see Jesus one day. Stay blessed as you live towards this goal and help others to do so. Let us pray. Faithful Heavenly Father, you love us more than we can think or imagine. We ask that you bless our hearts and our minds, reside within our temple, and may we keep holy as you are holy. We understand that our flesh is weak, but may we focus on the power through the Holy Spirit. Guide us as we navigate through this world, we pray. For we ask it in no other name, but that name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thanks again for watching. If you have been blessed, feel free to like, to share, and to subscribe if you have not yet done so. And as you do, may you rest in the wise, objective, resourceful, and definitive word of God. Amen.